that the first speaker we have is Martin Müller. Martin Müller is a young, new professor in our group, uh, in our department, and he studies mega events. This is our mega event, and he will be telling us the seven deadly sins we may have committed. Martin, please. In the Catholic Church, the seven deadly sins are sins of serious human misconduct. Misconduct that comes with threat of internal damnation and with threat of going to the one place of all places that you probably want least to go to, hell. If you're a city, a country, or an organization, you usually don't think in terms of damnation, hell, afterlife. But this is as close to hell as it can get for a city. What you could see here is a brief snapshot of the protests that uh, arrived through Brazil just uh, about half a year ago in June this year uh, in over a dozen Brazilian cities with a turnout of a million protesters, the largest protest since the end of the dictatorship in 1985 in Brazil. What were people protesting against? Well, against a lot of different things, but there was one key question that kept being asked, and this is the question that this guy here with the board is asking. With poor health care, poor public schools, uh, bad public transport, high taxes, rampant corruption, and a ridiculous minimum wage, how come that we can spare $26 billion for hosting next year's uh, World Cup and in 2016, the Summer Olympic Games, and uh, that we can foot this, this massive bill? So what are those mega wins? Most of us uh, know them, uh, almost all of us love them. They are mostly sports events, typically the Olympic Games, summer or winter, uh, also uh, the FIFA World Cup, for example, Euro, like uh, last year's Euro 2012 in Ukraine and Poland, but possibly also large-scale exhibitions like Expo or political summits. Or to put it in a little more academic lingo, mega events are one-time large-scale occasions that come with a significant disruption of urban routines and with a massive transformation of urban space. And increasingly, and perhaps we should add this to the, to the definition, they've been getting out of control. So what are the major wrongdoings, the seven deadly sins of mega events? And what is it that makes cities and countries end up in hell? And the first two that I'm going to uh, come up with here are not very surprising, but they bear mentioning for the very fact that we, we fall for them over and over and over again. The first one is the over-promising of benefits. The benefits you typically prom promise in the bid book. The bid book is the document that you submit to the IOC or FIFA, who then decides whether they want to give you a mega event or not. And one of my interviewees, when I conducted interviews, said, the bid book is science fiction. It's written by globally mobile consultants and catering to the expectations of those rights-owning organizations. But there is a very tenuous connection only to the re realities on the ground and what can be delivered. Typically, they promise economic impacts, economic impacts that are hardly measurable or sometimes even negative if you look at the academic studies. Or they promise an image improvement, and if there is an image improvement, it typically tends to be rather short-term or actually negative if you think of the coverage that a lot of mega events are rece receiving at the moment in Brazil or Russia. Then there is the underestimation of cost. Without a single exception, all mega events have underestimated the actual cost in the, the initial budget they, they were proposing, sometimes massively so. In Sochi, the next uh, upcoming Winter Games in February 2014, uh, the initial estimates were four times lower than the actual cost that we're seeing now. But also London last year with the Summer Olympic Games had estimates that it were only half of what it actually turned out to be. So this is not only a predicament of emerging economies or developing economies, but it actually characterizes mega events around the world. What is even more scandalous is the fact that 
expenditure is sometimes hidden in different budgets. So for example, security expenditure, which is usually quite high, is sometimes hid hidden in the budget of the Ministry of the Interior and doesn't turn up in the actual accounting for a mega event. The third deadly sin would be what I call event takeover. Event takeover ha happens when the priorities of the event become the priorities for urban development. The mayor of Rio de Janeiro a couple of years ago once said, the Olympics are Rio's plan and Rio's plan are the Olympics. This is probably the epitome of event takeover and the ultimate confession of failure of urban planning. When your urban planning idea is whatever a mega event tells you to do or not to do. And there are two consequences of this event takeover. One is gigantism. So uh, a construction that is geared towards the peak demand that you have an event, at an event at, in, in airports and subway stations and so on. And a neglect of post-event use because everything you build for an event, of course, needs to have an afterlife. It needs to be used and usually this um, gets blurred out if you focus on the event and if you have this um, sin of event takeover. For this public overfunding, public funding for frequently non-private, uh, non-public benefits. Events such as the Olympic Games, for example, demand a blanket deficit guarantee from the host country. So whatever deficits you have uh, as a host country, you need to commit to, to, to finance those, um, no matter how high. There's state risk taking to guarantee private profits. In Sochi, for example, 90% of the expenditure for the Olympic Games is borne by the state as are all the cost overruns, but most of the profits by individual hotel owners or ski resort owners accrue and go into the private um, pockets. Sin number five, elite capture. Elite capture happens when the mega event serves more the interests of the elite than those of the public. We see often rises in housing prices that uh, um, marginalize uh, low-income populations or nepotism where much of the money that is being distributed in um, state-funded contracts goes to um, close cronies of the ruling elite. I think the iconic case here is the Maracanã Stadium in Rio de Janeiro, which was renovated for the upcoming World Cup for uh, just shy of $600 million and then privatized at cut rate prices significantly below this. Uh, and given to a close crony of uh, one of the government officials. The ir irony of elite capture is, of course, that mega events uh, are supposed to be mass events. Uh, just remember the Roman phrase of panem et circenses, bread and games. And they are, the rationale is to have a broad public appeal, yet the benefits accrue to a very small circle of people. Number six, there is the rule of exception. The regular uh, rule of law is suspended and during the time of preparation for a mega event, there is a state of exception. When organizing the Olympic Games, for example, currently governments cede fiscal rulemaking authority to the IOC. They exempt the IOC and all attached associated organizations from paying taxes on revenues that they, um, that they generate during the Olympic Games. Also under high time pressure to finish construction in time for the opening ceremony, usual project reviews, environmental reviews, democratic participation procedures are um, cancelled and do not longer remain in force uh, because projects need to be fast-tracked. What happens is, of course, that citizens are excluded from this participation, reviews, mandatory reviews are skipped, and you have what just happened two, years, uh, two days ago in, uh, in Brazil, in the construction of a, a, a stadium in Sao Paulo where two workers died um, because uh, they had skipped the, the regular safety procedures and reviews. And finally, you have what I call the event fix. It's using mega events as a temporary fix, a temporary solution to override generally dysfunctional planning systems. The mayor of a city that hosted uh, a mega event recently told me, a mega event is like when your aunt from Kennedy, Canada comes to visit. You repair the house, you make a big spring, spring cleaning when all around the year you keep throwing the rubbish around. So what does that tell us? It tells us that events are often used as catalysts to get things done that you wouldn't get done ordinarily because in a city you're, you're caught in a deadlock. But it is a one-time fix. It's almost like giving yourself an adrenaline injection whenever you need to do something. And then you do something for a short period of time and then after the event's over, you go back into the normal state of affairs. 
So it does not attend to the actual task of making uh, public and urban planning more efficient. Now, most of you will be familiar with the seven deadly sins of old, not because you're very Catholic, but probably because you've watched the movie with Brad Pitt, which is called Seven. And the interesting thing is that there are surprising literal parallels between those modern-day uh, deadly sins of mega event planning and the seven deadly sins of old. This is a painting by Hieronymus Bosch, which you'll find in the Prado in Madrid. And it details the seven deadly sins. And I think with mega event planning, we can see things like pride, for example, with the attitude that we can do it better than others, we don't need any help, which leads to the underestimation of costs and to the exaggeration of benefits that I've highlighted. You can also see greed. Greed when uh, there's nepotism, corruption, contracts being awarded to close friends, what I've called elite capture. There's also gluttony, excess, building too large, what I've called gigantism or event takeover. And finally, there's also sloth, not, not, not acting fast enough, dragging your feet and needing an event fix to, to get into action and then falling back into your normal state of affairs. So perhaps then the remedy for those mega event deadly sins would be the same uh, remedy that the Catholic Church recommends. First repent, then atone, and finally attempt betterment. Our first step definitely would be to reduce the size of the infrastructure required for those mega events and to implement more effective oversight mechanisms. But honestly, uh, that's a big task, and how to best do that, I think I'll leave that to the next talk. Thanks. Thank you, Martin. Um, we don't take questions from the audience for this event, but I'm going to ask you one, <laughs> because I'm not the audience, I have the microphone. Um, so I'd like to uh, ask you if you have specific examples of successful events that avoided most of these scenes, um, scenes, not scenes. Um, would you have some um, in mind, or do you know of like a good example where these scenes weren't committed? Whether since we were committed or not committed. We're not committed. So I, I definitely don't have an example where, uh, which would be the shining example that, that's completely sin-free and would ascend to heaven straight away. But I think we, I mean, we can pick cases where you know, cities avoided a couple of sins and, and did away with them. Um, I think if, if we go, go back to those uh, seven sins, um, last year's London, they certainly had an over-promising of benefits and an underestimation of costs, but they didn't, didn't have event takeover. So their planning, they had long-term urban planning, which was, and the priorities were integrated with the event's priorities. So they didn't build a lot of things that were only used for the event. Vancouver, which about three years ago, three and a half years ago, had the Winter Games, I think also very successfully evented, avoided event takeover and elite capture they avoided as well to a large degree, although there are some, some exceptions. Rule, rule of exception was also avoided, but these always, there are always shades, you know. How, how, how much exception do you have? Do you have exception only in this little part where you skip the environmental review or fast track it and so on? Um, but I don't think there's one shining example that I, I could name. So, um, I guess then we can't really learn from one particular example and there's much more research to do. Thank you again, Martin.